I am so, so, so excited to introduce you to some, most of you probably already know my amazing guest who also happens to be basically my big brother and one of my favorite writers in the universe. His name is Steve Yaki. Hi, Steve. How are you? You are here. <laughs> um, it's good to be here. <laughs> so this yeah, I'm so excited. My cat is real excited that Steve is here and she's been jumping up the entire time. Um, so uh, I think this you, is- uh, uh, The cat does not like me. You can tell the internet. <laughs> the cat is like, who's this guy again? Um, yes. Well, okay. So this is a class about writing in the short form, writing 10 minute plays and, and evenings of 10 minute plays. Um, and this came from a question uh, from one of the viewers out there who wanted to know about writing 10 minute plays. Uh, so we're gonna get kind of into the practical nitty gritty of this pretty quickly um, because all of y'all are down for it and really wanna, wanna get better at your form and your craft. And I could not think of a better person to talk about this than Steve um, because even though he has written for TV and main stage, uh, plays across the world, really. Um, some of his plays are Octopus and Blackberry Winter, which that one went everywhere, and Mercury and Pluto, and there's a whole, several of them are named after planets. Um, and uh, yes, so he has a, a great, amazing career in writing a, like the normal full-length play, but also has this incredible ability to write just blisteringly funny or scary or bold short plays. Um, that are kind of genre, there is no genre. They are, they are totally Steve. Um, uh, he also is the person who basically turned me on to the power of dramatic structure. The reason why I went to grad school, Steve Yaki. Um, so I think we can talk about all, the, all of those things, but we'll specifically start with 10 minute plays. But before we do that, Steve, I know all about mm -hmm. you, but some of these people not. Would you tell us a little bit about where you come from, where you are at the moment, how you're doing um, and a little bit about kind of how you got to this point in your career and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I started out in college writing uh, short plays at the University of Georgia. And then I went to the American College Theater Festival Regional and had one of my short plays brutally eviscerated and was told that I shouldn't be a writer anymore. And so then I stopped writing for a little bit. <laughs> And then uh, oh, when, um, when we were living in Atlanta and I guess writing short plays for Dad's Garage, um, which was the place that we both sort of got a, a lot of our start in, in terms of having short work produced. I know you won the Berlicker Award when you were 18 and you're very famous, but when we were writing 10 minute plays. Um, and so uh, it, it just kind of went from there. And then um, I went to grad school at NYU and so did you. <laughs> Uh, and um, then I just, you know, it kind of took off from there. Um, and then uh, definitely I got into the TV work and most recently I was a co-executive producer on Supernatural and now I've got the show, The Flight Attendant, that's gonna be on HBO Max whenever the pandemic lets us <laughs> like do our jobs again. Um, but, uh, and right now I'm just staying at home, staying safe, um, staying healthy mentally healthy as well as physically healthy. I'm probably not mentally healthy. We're gonna get about 20 minutes into this, Lauren, and you're gonna know that I'm totally crazy right now, but it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, the truth is everybody is, so we're, we are not alone in our current madness. Um, I am watching for the comments online, so if y'all have specific questions for Steve at any point, um, throw them, throw them out there. Um, I am so not watching the comments with her so that you can say anything you want and I won't see it. <laughs> I, I will fill, I will filter them out and only tell them the the ones that make you sound awesome because you are. Um, so yeah, so I I I, <laughs> I am very intimidated by writing in the short form, um, and I kind of only did it because once again you tell me to do things, and I'm like that sounds like a good idea, and I should probably do them because Steve told me. So um, when we were writing short plays, it it, it was always hard for me, um, but it is a great way to get started. Can you talk about? Because you've also taught um, taught playwriting and certainly taught the short form. How do you approach teaching the short form? Um, and maybe does that differ, or does it is it the same of how you think when you sit down to write a short play? How do you how do you dive in and do it? I mean, the reality is when you sit down to work on a 
a short play. I get, I get, I get, I guess I get why it's intimidating, but I, I think it's super fun because you're essentially writing the first scene, the climax scene, and the last scene of your play all at the same time. Um, oh, that's such a and, great way to describe it, yeah. I mean, it, you have to do a lot in 10 minutes because um, like lots of these places that you'll submit to, to, pub, to uh, publish, <laughs> to produce your 10 minute plays, um, will tell you like, it can't be longer than 10 minutes. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things because if you're writing a monologue, then that's probably four pages as opposed to 10 pages. Um, but I think uh, maybe even three pages, but um, I, so I sit, when I sit down, I'm, I'm always kind of thinking about like, thematically, what am I interested in writing on, writing about? And then sort of like, what is my, what is my kind of grounded, intimate relationship between two of the characters on stage that can, that I can use to explore that theme? I think you really have to have a theme in mind. You really have to have an idea of what the intimate relationship is. And you, in a 10 minute play, you really have to know going in that you are, what your kind of main event of your play or your big turn is because you are heading for it from page one. Right, you know, like very quickly. Play, yeah, you have like, you have like a single page to kind of establish your world, even if it's a mystery and we're supposed to sort of like, and part of the, the trick of the play is you've got, ooh, as an audience member, I have to figure out what exactly is going on or what exactly is, is being set up. Even if so, even it's a, a mystery, you still are doing the work of building, like you immediately, there's not very much um, stasis for you to have your inciting yes. incident. It's like, go. And you just kind yeah. of immediately have this very steep roller coaster climb or ride, it can go all over the place. I mean, you can do anything to people for 10 minutes if they know it's only 10 minutes long. You can, you can make it as crazy as you want to. You can make it as still as you want to. I mean, I have a 10 minute play called um, When It Happens, It Will Happen Quietly. And it's about two uh, teenage or teenage to young adult women that um, are eating soup. And it's two pages long, but it takes 10 minutes to perform because of all the silence in it. And you realize over the course of the play that they are, they are <laughs> eating their father in a soup because he wasn't feeding them. Um, and it's, and that thematically for me, I'm like, I'm writing about um, class and I'm writing about income inequality and I'm writing about all those things wrapped up in this kind of child parent relationship. And I know that kind of the event of the play is going to be when the younger sibling realizes what she's eating and then makes the decision to keep eating it. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of like step back and you kind of let yourself, like, those are the things. I tend to ramble, so just jump in. I'm just trying well, to- Well, but what, what's, I'm getting some, some questions, a lot of questions, this is awesome. Um, but I, I will say one, to, to go back to that first point, because on my classes, that's one of the things I've talked about is once you know that beginning, middle and end, of a full length play. And I, again, I'm usually write full lengths, but in a 10 minute play, it's actually ex excellent practice because you have to make those decisions right away. You don't get to wander for 10 pages to discover your character. No, -uh. you got to start and go. And I will say so many of your plays start with such a bang. They start with like an act of violence or a big old crazy monologue that's either like angry or really like uh, strangely peppy, like, ah, you know, and it, you just go right in and you're kind of forced to, it's the deep end of a play and then that you kind of have to save your sink or swim basically which I, I i love that how do you can you talk about starting the play again like what is it how do you how do you come to just how, how you start these things so from yeah sure that was very nice everything you just said i'm not sure it's 100 percent true but that was very kind of you um i do think with the with look with full length plays you're right like i very seldom do when i sit down to write a full length play do i write the first scene that is going that the audience is going to see. I start somewhere else in the play, whatever that kind of emotional impetus or thematic impetus is, I dig into that and that's where I start writing from. With a 10 minute play, very often I start with like the first image, like the first thing the audience is going to see, what is, or the first thing they're gonna hear. Like, because you basically, look, whether you're writing a short play or you're writing a full length play, I think you wanna let the audience know very quickly that they're in good hands so that they will trust you and kind of relax. And then you can take them any crazy place you wanna take them 
once you've kind of showed them, I know the fundamentals of what I'm doing. I'm telling you a story, come with me on this. It's going to have a dramatic payoff because we all know the feeling of sitting in a theater, especially, I mean, it, it's true in full length plays, but most full length plays don't make it all the way to production and still have this problem. But you'll go see a 10 minute festival and there will be like one play that feels like 17 or 18 minutes long. And then you'll look at your watch and it's only been three minutes. And the reason is because nobody kind of, there, there is no um, context given to you in the first page to kind of like, this is the world that we're living in. Like if I'm writing about a woman who's afraid of what, what's it? Uh, I have a short play about a woman who has keranothnetophobia, which is this amazing fear of man-made satellites falling from the sky on them, but that's a real thing. And as soon as I read that, I was like, 10 minute play. That's a 10 and, minute play. <laughs> But like on the first page, her daughter shows up and is like, you haven't been answering your phone. And she's like, I'm fine. And she's like, why do you have that iPad? And she's like, what iPad? And hides it behind her back. And she's like, oh my God, you're doing it again. You're looking for satellites. And we're like in it. Do you know what I mean? And we've got a mother-daughter yeah, relationship. Right we've got what's, we've got kind of, oh, this kind of woman in a bathrobe who seems very much like everyone's grandmother is afraid of falling satellites. And she may in fact have, been keeping these people hostage in her house <laughs> to try and save them. I don't know, whatever's <laughs> happening in that in that play. Um, this kind of goes to a question that somebody just asked about, how do you make exposition work in a 10 minute play, which is kind of what you're talking about, like go in quick, like set it up as quick as you can so that you can have the rest of the time to, to pay it off, right? Yeah, you can either, because it's a 10 minute play and that, that thing that I said, I. I think I said it, but that I always say about 10 minute plays is that you can do anything to an audience for 10 minutes because they know that it's only 10 minutes. Um, they're coming to see short plays. So if you want to have a crazy narrator that spouts exposition and has strong opinions, you can do that. I think uh, Elizabeth Diggs actually at NYU taught me the best thing about uh, exposition period, whether it's 10 minute plays or full length plays is the best kind of exposition is ammunition. And mm. it's this the concept that rather than have people in it, if you've got 10 pages, like to tell this story, I want to immediately have some form of conflict. And so those people yelling at each other and it, during that fight revealing like, you do this every time we go to Denny's, you like order this thing that you can't finish. It makes me furious and I want a divorce. Well, I just got a lot of information about their marriage oh, in man. like two lines, um, especially if the person's response is, but it tastes good. Like if there is a disconnect between them. And yeah. so you're kind of getting this, you, 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 exposition as ammunition is a great way to do it. it it's, the sooner you can get people disagreeing about something, the sooner you can like unspool the kind of exposition that would could be like in a clunky way. What is, remember that dream I had? Or yeah. what about that time to the lake? Like those kinds of things. Um, and lots of people, it seems like with 10 minute plays, they want to write like two character pieces, which is, which is great. I mean, it's great. There's a lot of um, value in that. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do, but also um, what's tricky about that is you can fall really easily in a two character play. If you're just writing an emotional play, if you haven't thematically decided what your play is about, and it's just about like two people breaking up, um, then you Sorry, can end up with a lot of, yeah. you can end up with a lot of like inert exposition, like exposition yeah. that's not dramatically active. And that's when the play starts to feel kind of languid and you're like, oh, it's so beautiful, but I'm having trouble connecting to it. And that's, yeah. that's a lot of what that is, I think. Um, so let's see a couple of these questions since we're here. Let's, thanks for all these great <laughs> comments. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, thanks for your question. Um, you talked about leaning into, oh, this is, um, I was talking about having big emotions and trying to make your character, what is the thing that's going to make their biggest emotion happen? Um, so how does that change in a short play is her question so that it doesn't seem like melodrama or unearned? Can you talk about like, I guess, big characterization, big emotions, like how do you do that in a short form? I think you have to decide right from the beginning. You're, you're you, on page one. You're telling the audience how to watch your play, like from the hmm. first from the first exchange that happens in your play, and the, the lights come up, and here's a lunchroom, or here's a boat, or here's a you know, if you're Actors Theater of Louisville, a fully realized set of a city, like whatever it is. Um, you can you're, you're telling people right away how to watch your play, and so if you're gonna have a play with big emotion 
you just let them know from page one, this is a play that's going to have big emotion. You, you build the context for the emotion that you want to have. And so there's two ways you can do that, right? If you have everyone speaking sort of very calmly and trying to stay calm and actively working to keep everything very naturalistic, then if someone explodes into a big ball of emotion at some point, they're doing that because they can no longer live within the constraints. It's the reason people start singing in a musical. Yeah, right. You know, they can no longer live within the constraints that the character has been given. Or you just write a play that has big emotions. And after you write the first draft of it, you go back and you do a shaping pass. And mm -hmm. you go, okay, how do I have these like kind of blips early in the play that let people know this is a capable this is a character capable of going to this place, or this is a character with a lot of feeling, but I never imagined that they would go to this place. I mean, some of my favorite short plays, like when I was first starting to write short plays are Christopher Durang short plays. And they're, they're you know, borderline absurd. They're hysterical, yeah. but also he's doing something there where you can have a woman whose only function in the play is to scream at the top of her lungs every time she hears anyone else mention jumping I don't like there's one of those plays where they're all standing like the one woman's like gonna jump off the edge of a building whatever I'm not gonna go down that road but that, yeah. that character was originally <laughs> played by Bonnie Wraith the American rock singer so I think I think That's it's just great. you have to you're responsible for letting people know right off the bat um what what world they're in yeah and if it's if it's a pl if it's a world where big emotions can happen then it won't feel melodramatic. It will just feel like the play that you have started in motion. But I also think that's that's great. I mean, for for full length plays too. If you get to a point where you write like the most amazing aggressive monologue and she's throwing crap and and you kind of haven't seen that in her that her before, ask yourself, is is that the same character? Like, did you mess up? Should that be somebody else doing it? Or how do we plant it exactly as you said like how do you drop seeds little clues that this that this character can do that and maybe that's you learned your play when you wrote that monologue and you're like oh that i want to write the whole play getting me here and that's great you can go back and you know have somebody be like well as long as you don't break you know freak out like you did last week or <laughs> just little little tiny things to go oh without giving it away, of course, but that's, I think, part of what you mean by a shaping pass or kind of how do you earn the thing that you suddenly go, this is what I was writing about. I mean, the great thing about 10 minute plays is, yeah, sure, there's a, there's a, there's actually a, a good bit of construction necessary for uh, an effective 10 minute play, but you don't, when you, when you watch it, you don't feel that work, like you don't feel mm -hmm. that effort because you write a pass of your 10 minute play and then you go back and you say, now that I have this thing and I think that this is the kind of like raw material of it, it's so much easier to edit a 10 minute play than it is. Like it's daunting when you have to edit a full length play and you're like, oh God, if I change this one thing in the first scene, I have to track it through this whole damn play. And, um, and then like, you know, you get six scenes into the rewrite and you're like, it's not doing what I want it to. Like, it's like, and, it, and, you, and you get angry. So I yeah. think it's, it's fun for me to edit 10 minute plays because um, you really you really feel like you have a sense of, you have your hands around the entire play. Yeah. Like, it's yes. not like, oh, I forgot what happens on page seven. Like you can just scroll and look. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, right there. you know, it's not difficult in that way. Um, this uh, Karen asked, how do you address the blank canvas of starting a piece? Do you always sit down with an idea or do you ever just write? Uh, I'm not good at, at sort of free writing. Um, I sort of, the way I approach playwriting is that I usually have something that I, that I want to write about, like I've just a topic or a theme yeah. that I'm interested in exploring. And then when I kind of get a glitch or, you know, with 10 minute plays in particular, I've been commissioned to write like on a specific topic or the festival right. has a specific kind of entry point or the contest, whatever it is that you're entering. Um, and those can be really helpful. So if they're helpful when you get them from other people, then they're they're also helpful when you choose them for yourself right yeah give yourself a little little something um, i mean a blank you is always intimidating so a blank page is always intimidating if nothing else i'll just like make up a character page of things that i don't even know are going to be in the 10 minute play just to like be writing something and then be like oh this 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 character dot that i just described sounds fun i'm gonna throw her into this and see what happens and then i start on page one but you, there's all kinds of tricks we everybody's got their own tricks they play on themselves right right 
Yes, yes. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, 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 maybe for a second, can you talk about um, where you tend to have your 10 minute plays um, produced? Who do you work with? Who does 10 minute plays? Like, if you have some great ones, what do you do with them? It's weirdly getting, it, it feels like, it feels like it's getting smaller, like the number mm -hmm. of places, well, the number of places producing theater in general, but we won't get into the like larger <laughs> macro conversation that would depress everyone. <laughs> but um, City Theater in Miami is a real standout for me uh, for two reasons. One, they take unsolicited submissions in, through their contest that they have every year. Um, and two, whoever wins that contest gets produced along with nine or 10, or I think this was gonna be their 25th anniversary. So I think they were gonna do two full programs of uh, nine plays each. Um, but they produce this thing called Summer Shorts every year. And uh, they've commissioned me for the past eight years maybe. And, um, and, and it's fun for me because they get a lot of two character plays. So they're always like, can you write something that uses our entire cast? And I'm like, I would love to. Um, but uh, because most people write two character plays, yeah. yeah. Um, but so City Theater, and I would just look them up. Their contest is amazing. And um, the best thing about them, I think, is they fully produce plays at a level that uh, you would expect to see in New York. Yeah, their I productions mean, are amazing. Yeah, oh, because you've had, yes. Okay, so because we've been there together, yes. <laughs> I, they didn't do a 10 minute play though. They did, it was one of my children's festivals, but we were there together, yeah. And I got to see it, it was it was amazing. So like City Theater, obviously the Humana, Humana Theater Festival does um, the three, um, I think. Well, uh, I think they stopped, I don't know if they're still having the contest, but they stopped doing the tens for a little bit. Um, I, I know they still look for plays for the apprentice program to do. Yeah. So there, it's a good place to submit but I don't want the literary manager at ATL to be like, Steve Yaki, shut up, because I don't know if they, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, how, how much that's still happening right now with the leadership change. Yeah. Um, and there are always, you should find local, cause like when we were writing for Dad's Garage and they were doing eight and a half by 11 with when Kate Warner was curating it, mm -hmm. they did eight and a half, cause there was a half play that, that the whole company created together, but they did eight 10 minute plays and they commissioned specific writers so my thing is always, and I know there are theaters that do that in different communities. It, it comes down to the same thing for me, whether it's a 10 minute play or a full length play, you need to get to know the theaters in your community and develop a relationship with them because they are going to be the kind of gateway to the larger American theater community. You're like gonna move through them to out into the field, which you know you get in the field and you realize it's like this big, but it feels like gigantic when you're first when we're sitting in our yeah. apartment in Atlanta going like, how do we get out of Atlanta? Like that, you know? Steve and I actually had an apartment together in Atlanta and had this conversation, so. <laughs> right that's, next that's, door, it looks down on dad's garage. It does, <laughs> yes, true, true story, true story. Um, yes, okay, so uh, a couple of questions. You have a lot of fans on here. Steve is literally the best. I agree. <laughs> um, my, so his question, Shea King's question is, my question for Steve is, when do you know if a short play wants to not be so short or vice versa? I think it's like, have you ever had a short play that you're like, oh no, this is a big play or the big play and you're like, nah, it's, it's actually 10 minutes. I have a piece of a, I have a, a, a piece of a monologue in a, in a short play that ended up kind of inspiring me to write a much longer play, but it was sort of in a different context. Yeah. Um, I don't, for me, because I'm such a structure junkie, uh, I feel like when I have a 10 minute play idea, I usually, uh, it, it's usually is what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah. My longer ideas tend to be things that thematically need a bunch of different layers or entry points. Whereas if thematically I'm like, here's an idea, here's a visual image that fits with it, and here's the person that connects those things. Okay, 10 minute play, go. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But honestly, like one of my favorite writers in books is um, Murakami, and he, uh, he has a ton, if you read his short stories, he has a ton of short stories. Like there's one about a guy making spaghetti that turned into um, the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. Like, I mean, there's like, he takes his short stories and then they blow out into full like insane novels. So lots of people have that. Um, for me, I tend to think if it's a, if it's a strong theme, but it, it is a sort of simple idea, not simple as in dumb, but simple as in easy to render, 
then um, it's a good 10 minute play. And if it's more complex and it requires like more points of view to get into it and kind of layers that you're gonna explore and like build a house on, then that's probably a, a one act or a full length play. Yeah. Although I, 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 I don't know, Lauren, like my, my experience is there aren't many people in the American theater that are looking for what people used to call one acts because now one acts are like yeah. 90 minute plays. <laughs> You know yes. what I mean? Yeah, like, I think one act kind of disappeared as a... Yeah, that is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is there. Um, let's for a second go into, since you are a structure junkie, which is why I am one as well. Um, can we talk a little bit about that 10 minute play structure, the kind of essentialized version of dramatic structure? Um, we talked about the beginning and kind of doing that exposition really quickly, jumping in. What is your kind of midpoint, halfway point, um, kind of the the math of that for you and then what is an ending how do you know that climactic ending is there um you described a little bit earlier but can you kind of walk us through how you kind of go oh yeah that's exactly what i want this to be or whatever choice that is at the end i mean honestly the big kind of there's like it, it depends on on what the topic that you're writing about is and and so i don't i this is not custom fit i mean it's it is custom fit to every play but generally you're going to reach your climax like at the bottom of page seven or somewhere on page eight and then have a little bit of room for a denouement unless you're writing a play that ends like a series like a cliffhanger or something like like if 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 the big reveal at the end of your play is well i buried him alive blackout you know and then the audience <laughs> is like oh like then that's like you know that's amazing like um yeah, yeah. but I tend to, I tend to, like, what I'll do is I'll tend to start the play, I'll write the first page, write the second page, once I get into, like, a rhythm, I'll be like, okay, but I need to know that I can get where I'm going, so I'll just jump further into the documents, yeah. like, I'll just skip down, like, space bar, space bar, space bar, space bar, down onto the next page, so there's space there, and yeah. then I'll kind of attack what I think is going to be the the moment of the play, whether it's a man in a tiger suit walks in and throws glitter at everyone, or whether it's, you know, junk falls from space crashing onto the stage, like whatever that moment is. And then I'll start working backwards from there. And then you kind of realize as you're working backwards from that point, you're like, oh God, I've only got two more pages to connect like where I am to where I was. And it kind of, it starts to like flush in and, and feel like it. And you may end up like, it's a little longer and then you have to pull back. Yeah. But I do think it's that. And then I, I don't think there's any point in writing anything past the climax of your play until you write the climax of your play. Because that kind of like beautiful ending that you kind of see in your head, that lovely moment where they just needed to hold hands or like whatever it is. Um, if you write that first, you might fall into a trap, which I see lots of my students fall into, which is that you do a soft curve. Like you, you basically, and if you're looking at an Aristotelian model, right, there's rising action climax and then denouement. They'll do this kind of soft curve where they're so focused on the beautiful moment at the end that they kind of don't really write the climax. They kind of dodge the climax, which is the hardest yeah. part of the play. Um, and lots of 10 minute plays do that. Um, even 10 minute plays mm -hmm. that, that we know and love or that we you know, have seen up on stage um, kind of suffer from that problem. So it is, it is kind of like getting it going and then like looking ahead and making sure you know what that kind of big turn is that's going to make this 10 minute play worthwhile for an audience. Yeah. Um, and when your plays, when your 10 minute plays have that, they tend to stand out and they tend to be the kinds of plays that when people are reading for festivals or reading for, and I don't just mean like, like I write crazy weird shit. Like I just write crazy plays, apologize for my language, but I, I'm not saying you have to write a crazy play. You just have to, you have like to have choice. that. You have to have an event. There has to be an event in your 10 minute play. Um, whether that event is like, you know, your happy couples, one of them just spins around and is, has after being like yelled at for like eight pages, she spins around and is like, that's why I killed my last husband. Like whatever, it, I mean, I don't know. That didn't feel yeah. earned. That was awful. That no, was what great. they said. But anyway, that's that's the idea. But it's, like, but it's true, oh. though. I mean, even what you were talking about with the soup play, the climactic moment is her continuing to eat, which is a big, that's huge. Like, it may be small and soft, but it is a massive decision that defines who that character is. And that's, again, that's what we've been talking about in terms of 
pulling play is that character defining moment in the climax where we go, oh, this is who you are, okay. So something that does that, whether it is an explosion or a reveal or an exit or a punch in the nose or something that kind of, you know, makes it, um, yeah, that's, that, that's what we're watching for. We're waiting to see that. And usually you tie it to what, I mean, just like in a, a, a full length play, I mean, you tie it, to, it's recognition and reversal. Like that's what, ha yeah. something has to change in your 10 minute play, right? So yes. at some point, your main character has to recognize something new or some new piece of information or that the world is different than they thought it was and then make a decision or change in course off of that, right? Yeah, exactly. And so it, it's the recognition and reversal and then making sure that whatever that moment is, is tied to the event of the play, like what the play is about. You know yeah. what I mean? If, if the play is about, oh my gosh, we live in a we live in a weird country where it rains frogs every like two days, but it hasn't rained frogs. And now everyone's freaking out about it because they think that means something bad. And you're thinking to yourself, it's going to rain frogs on this play. And it, it, whenever, if it does, if it rains frogs or if it rains birds for some reason, I don't know why I'm giving you all the Aristophanes references. I'm I love sorry. it. I love it. <laughs> if it rains birds for some reason, instead of frogs at some point in the play, and no one knows what that means, it needs to be tied to like, like the main character like suddenly realizes oh the reason it rains frogs all the time is because we treat each other this way and then it starts raining birds and yeah. it's like oh fuck or oh. you know what what the decision is but they need to be they need to be tied together because it's always super fun when you're hearing someone talk about their 10 minute play and you're like or you're at like one of these uh, because after being as i mentioned totally destroyed in college at the American College Theater Festival. Now I do that uh, Drama Skilled Foundation will like send me, and mm -hmm. I always volunteer to go to the ACTF regionals <laughs> so that I can respond to 10 minute plays and tell them that they're good writers um, and try and help them tell the story they want to tell. Yeah. Um, and so when I do that, it's, it's always like you ask students sometimes, what is it like, why is this in here? And they're like, I just thought it was really cool. And that's a good answer, but then you have to, but then it has to be tied to the emotional journey of your character. You have to, you have to, you have to connect it. Um, yeah. Your Aristophanes reference is a great segue to this question about okay. <laughs> <laughs> working it. Um, it was, what is it, mythology? Oh yeah, so Riley Smith says, how do you go about incorporating lores and mythologies into your world and your stories? I think specifically your plays. How do you, um, how do you do that? I do it, I, I mean, I do it a lot. I grew up reading those Dolores, um, like the Greek myth book and then the Norse mythology book that had like the, the hand painted illustrations and everything. Yeah. Um, which I was like, when you're a little kid and your mom gives you that book, you read like, then Zeus had sex with these three women. And you're like, I'm too young for this. <laughs> but, um, but the murder part was fine. Um, so I, I usually think of it in terms of how do I want to use a certain device, a theatrical device, like a, in Greek, like, so I have this play that they did at um, Actors Theater of Louisville and they did a, Meredith McDonough directed a beautiful production of it. And the set gets covered with blood and destroyed every night. So they built two completely different versions of the set so they could do it both nights um, called Joshua Consumed an Unfortunate Pair. And that has very Greek undertones to it, but it was really informed by the fact that I wanted to use a Greek chorus in a 10 minute play. And I wanted to have this like group of people who had all been killed in some strange and unusual way, standing off to the side, commenting on what Joshua did in the play, a la a Greek play. And then like a lot of Greek plays, Joshua was aware of the chorus and could hear their comments and uh, was interacting with them. And so that just meant for me like, all right, well, if I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna dip into this form, I should go ahead and like work some mythology into it. I should like fully embrace that idea. Yeah. Sometimes when you wanna tell, I mean, look, Myths are stories that people told themselves to explain the world around them. We still do that, right? I mean, like, we, I'll, I'll give you a good example because it was on the other day. Um, I pointed at my TV. You can't tell where I'm pointing. I'm sorry. Um, it was on way. the other day, but um, there was like a, a Jeep commercial that was on and it was like, you know, they showed a Jeep like driving through the woods and it looked really cool and like, it looked very like you were in it with the Jeep and like, and, um, and it was rain, it was Pacific Northwest, just painting the picture for you. Yeah. So there was splashing water and manly and this deep voice is like, in America, we build things. That's what we've always done and that's what we do. 
that's a myth that we tell ourselves. Like that's a, that is a myth. That is a story that is perpetuated from like the 1930s and 40s, 40s, 40s and 50s. Like we don't, we're a service-based economy. Like that's not a true thing, but we still buy it because it's on TV. Yeah. And TV is like our modern version of like, here's how I reinforce how you think about yourself. Um, and so that's all myths are. And you can reappropriate Greek myths, Norse myths, any kind of whatever cultural thing or religious iconography that you want. You can, that was given meaning by people. You can give it a different meaning. You just have to do the work to do that. But if you kind of lay it into your, even in a 10 minute play, you can do it. Yeah. Well, you can make I, it I think of some of your plays like Min the Minotaur play where it, you can use that as a way into telling a grand story, but then you also use it to talk about something different, to talk about something that's really resonant now, that's modern now, that's, you know, so it, 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 it's a really kind of fun way to, to, to time hop a little bit between the accepted um, mythology and what our mythologies are now that we're trying to, to break out of or to challenge. Absolutely, because you can, you, can you can use ancient stories to subvert people's ideas of what is happening right now. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, for a second, let's talk about, or maybe not for a second, for some amount of seconds, however long you choose. Um, let's talk about the, um, uh, so you've, you've done this a couple of times where you create evenings of short plays, some of which you have curated. I was a part of one called Bread and Circuses uh, that we did in the Bay Area, which was so cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was really, really fun. So can you talk about for those out there who like love this form and for producers who love the form, what is a successful evening of 10 minute plays um, look like? How do you how did you choose it? I mean, and you kind of worked with each writer and kind of commissioned each writer, um, each of us to build a, a play that was kind of our own idea, but also a part of the whole. Can you talk about that that process? Yeah, I, that was a twofold inspiration. One was that Impact used to do these shows, at these short play festivals, and I, I think it was called How To. I wish Joy Meads was here because she, when she was at Cal Shakes, she also was curating these evenings for Impact and like doing that kind of, and Joy Meads is a hero of the American theater. Indeed. Um, but uh, I, uh, I was inspired by that. So I know Impact was open to the idea of doing short work because some theaters, aren't um some people just kind of look at 10 minute plays like why would i waste my time with that even though it's incredible for an audience when it's done well i mean it, the audience gets so much out of it um and the other thing is dad's garage when sean daniels and kate warner were at dad's garage and when they took eight and a half by 11 that festival i mentioned earlier and they kind of took it from all the theaters in town can kind of make a 10 minute play um and they changed it to the theme this year is punk rock will never die the theme this year is the birds and the bees. The theme and the commissioned playwrights were given like, you can have no more than six actors. You don't have to use six actors. It has to be 10 minutes long. And the theme is the birds and the bees. Do whatever you want with that. I think that helps. Like it helps to give a focus to an evening because then you're getting to see all of these different playwrights lenses, all of it, all people are paying us for is playwrights. Like if you're lucky enough to get paid as a playwright it is because people are paying for the way that you personally see the world and how you reflect it back to them through your lens, right? That's what's special about you. The only thing that's special about you is like how you tell a story that everybody else is telling, right? And so when you get to kind of have a theme like bread and circuses, when that was about like, that I basically was like, can we please do a 10 minute play about the decline of Western civilization and like all of this, like all the ways that we're distracted um, from the real issues and all of that stuff. And then, and people like you wrote a post, post apocalyptic play about women putting on makeup that turned out to be like a war party. And it was very feminist and powerful. And I, I think, but then like Declan Green from Australia wrote that 10 minute play where the, every time the guys, uh, Every time the guy's um, marumba, it was called marumba. Every time his iPhone alarm went off, he had to restart telling the story of his life and go as fast as possible to try and get to the end before the marumba thing went off again. And each time it got more violent, each time he told it. Um, that's that's a good the, play. <laughs> that's the best, one of the best ones. Eric Kerr did the uh, acting in it. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. Plays I've ever seen. So, um, you know, I think when, for theater producers that are out there and interested, it's, there's one thing that feels very like, like 
like if you're doing the 24 hour plays or whatever, it's amazing what they do because they do it in 24 hours. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But if you're going to produce an evening of 10 minute plays, um, I think having some type of thematic linchpin helps the audience uh, invest and also uh, engage. Um, and then I also think it helps the writers too, um, because then you go and you see all the different ways and you see the way someone else interpreted it and you're like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I never would have done that. Yeah. And that's what's great about a 10 minute play is you're getting to see all of these different lenses on a particular topic. I wonder if that form will come back. For some reason I've been thinking about, is that what we're gonna be doing when all this is over? Like short bursts of big ideas and big emotion and big characters and then like here's another one and here's another one and here's another one for some reason i was like it may, maybe that's where we're somebody make i don't know somebody out there take that run with it bring back the 10 minute play the evening of 10 minute plays because you think about beckett and alby and there were so many of these incredible writers that have just breathtakingly exciting 10 minute plays and maybe that's a way I will say it. Thank you for talking about Dad's Garage so much because that was when I was a young writer. Steve and I were both um, writing a lot of these 10 minute plays um, for Dad's Garage. And that was such a gift to me as a writer to be commissioned. You know, it was a small commission, but it was a small play. But you had a professional production, work with some of the best actors in town. Um, and, and you were in community of all these other writers like Dave Holstein. Remember Dave Holstein did one one year. Um, there was like all of these incredible writers. On um, Alice, Alice Twan. Twan. I wanted to write. I wanted to. I wanted to write full-length plays instead of short plays because of Alice Twan's short plays. Yeah. She's so amazing. She's so amazing. Yeah. And writers that you wouldn't, we wouldn't have been exposed to if Dad's Garage wasn't commissioning these people from all over the country to write ten-minute plays where they were a theater company that couldn't afford to commission full-length plays and produce full-length plays the way South Coast Rep does or yeah. some other theaters but they could commission 10 minute plays and do an evening of them. And your audience then in your city is getting exposed to a, a bunch of writers from their own hometown that maybe aren't ready to have a full length play put on the stage, but know what the fuck they're doing and, and can deliver in a 10 and minute have a big old voice. Yeah. And mixing them with uh, more established writers that an audience might recognize or more established writers that they won't recognize, but that you know can deliver a 10 minute play is a good way to kind of like enrich your your own community through 10 minute plays. I, that, <laughs> yeah, that's such a great point because that is what it, what it was. It was so exciting to have a play in the same evening as Alice Twan and all of us were just like so, 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 so excited. Um, or like one year it was Lisa Crone and I was oh, yeah. like, what the, f okay. You what know? is the crown? Yeah, so that that's a really interesting way also to kind of spread the wealth of a great production and an audience eyes and ears and souls that are there to see this this work is to be able to say, instead of commissioning one writer, we'll commission 10. And then, I don't know, like more plays, more actors and more directors get involved. And it seems like, I don't know, I'm getting more excited about this, America. <laughs> back the 10 minute play festival <laughs> I remember the most what i remember the most about those those nights with the uh, eight and a half by 11 was it was always like funny 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 and then they'd get to yours and it was like oh <laughs> and then funny funny and then they'd get to mine and they'd be like Ugh. <laughs> and then it was funny funny and then everybody gets to leave right like yeah, that was exactly. the, you know and we have we have crystallized into those career paths <laughs> i don't know i i when I think of your stuff, I think of it as funny. And I think my stuff is funny, but then has the, it's like funny till it's not. That's definitely my world. Sorry, my cat. Yeah, is yours is funny around. until it's heartbreaking and mine is funny until it's traumatizing. It's fine, yes, we're fine. <laughs> High five, perfect, balance. The world is in balance. <laughs> um, all right, so a couple more questions from folks out here. Um, one was about if your 10 minute plays taught you anything or prepared you for TV writing in any way, if you don't mind talking about TV for a second. Uh, Did yeah. it? Um, there's a, when I, whenever I'm asked like by an MFA program or something to, to, to teach a class, I always want to teach this short form class and it's short form, which is like, a, they have to write a 10 minute play. They have to write a seven minute film. They have to write a seven page comic book story. Um, it's like that kind of thing. Like it, and the whole lesson of the class, right. Which is not hard to decipher is like story is story, yeah. but I do think a 10 minute play prepares you for a more condensed um, you have to get to it quicker. And the thing about television is like, I remember I wrote my first television script and I was so proud of it. And it was a 34 page like cable dramedy. And I gave it to my friend, Ross Maxwell, who was writing for Glee at the time. Um, you know, yeah, our friend Ross. Ross. Hello. Be like my friend Ross. 
um, who's now on Sabrina, but he, he, um, he took it and he's like, Hey man, I don't want to, I know how you are. And he meant like testy and defensive. Um, he's like, I know how you are, but, um, can I, can I please, uh, just, just take a, take a pass on this and editing pass to kind of give you a sense of what TV actually looks like. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that would be okay. And he gave it back to me and it was, it had been 34 pages, I guess. And it was 18 pages and it was all the same scenes, but they were all much, much shorter. No scene longer than two pages. Everything communicated clearly, but there was, it's just, you know, you never have a scene longer than two pages unless you're Aaron Sorkin or the like. Um, and so it's like, it does get you used to the, the idea of getting, getting into it quicker. Yeah. Like starting later and getting out fast. That's, yeah. that's what you want to do with every single scene anyway, but that's definitely yeah. in television. And I think yeah, 10 minute yeah. plays help with that. I also think 10 minute plays help you with your normal playwriting, normal. I think we keep, you said it, now I'm saying it normal. I know. With your full length playwriting full length. in that um, if you can do a 10 minute play that's a sustained 10 minute play that isn't broken into scenes because that's really hard for an audience. Um, that's true, if, that's a good tip. Like usually yeah. 10 minute plays don't have scene breaks. Yeah, like if you one. do scene breaks, it, 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 it's difficult for an audience to kind of get their brain, brain around that. Yeah. Um, unless it's like something where it's starting over and they're seeing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. um like a la Carol Churchill yeah. um so if you if you can write that sustained 10 minute scene then you then you're in good shape when you have to sit down and write scene three of a full-length play and scene three has to have just as much interest just as much dynamism just as much engagement and just as much going on even though you can't have the climax of your play yet scene three has to have you know, that shape and, yeah. and stakes and conflict and all of those things. So if you can do it in a 10 minute play, then you can do it for each scene within your full length play, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that's such a great note. I mean, it, I always prefer to start, start way farther in than like, she opens the door, yawns, another day dawning. And you're like, oh God, I want to start with her being like, what the hell just happened? You know, <laughs> put me there, start the scene there. So I'm like running to catch up to it instead of like, and then she's going to get coffee and then she's going to check the newspaper and but, oh, something happened. <laughs> but I will say, yeah, but, and, and that's very much my taste also. <laughs> my taste isn't like, hello, welcome to the theater. But sometimes, sometimes people's personal, like all of this you take with a grain of salt, right? Because yeah. your personal, it, it all goes back to your personal lens as a writer. Like if you are a writer who knows that you can spend one page with her being like, oh, this coffee is so delicious. Yeah. This is the most amazing morning. I'm by myself in my house. I, my husband went to work early this morning and I'm all alone. I think today's going to be a really great day. And it's just going and you're like, what is this? And then someone who's on fire runs in. Like, <laughs> then, you know what I mean? Then you've done your job. Like, then it's like, you, you have your interest. Stasis, disruption. <laughs> yeah, the phone rings and she goes to answer it and she screams and all of a sudden that tableau freezes and like a marching band walks on. So like, whatever. It doesn't have to be insane like that. I'm sorry, I just go to that place. But, um, but I do think that you, you know, if you don't have to, you don't have to jump right in, but you do have to, you don't have to jump right into, ah, but you do have to jump right into your storytelling. Yeah. You have to jump right into something that is like clear, decisive. Yeah. I, and I think that's the lesson over and over for all of these forms of um, storytelling is decision. You have to be the one with the decision. You can't wait for the play to decide for you. You go, here's the character. And now you can do whatever you need to do, talking to yourself, walking around, taking a shower and iterating, you know, whatever you need to do to figure something out. But then once you start the play, like it has to be clear so that you know, I know, I know this character, so I know how to destroy them. I know this character, so I know how to make them the happiest they've ever been in their lives. And, Which, and we, can, we can simplify it even further and say, your character has to want something and every single thing that they say in the play has to have a playable action attached to it that is trying to get what they want. I, I mean, that's that. very actorly, like that's a very like actorly way to think about it. But it, your, your protagonist is the person who has a goal that drives your play. And in moving towards their goal, they're pushing the action of the play, right? And so even in a 10 minute play, everybody has to want something. Yeah. It can't be like, 
and want something people. like yeah. real, real bad. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, exactly. All right, so let's see a couple more. Oh, one other um, question was about writing for a specific actor, which I know you've done a lot. Um, and I will say when I, I mean, I'm, as you all know, I'm very much about um, uh, women in the, th women's stories, female writers, but I always use Steve as an example of a male writer ally who writes incredible roles for women. So th this oh, the f feminism in theater isn't always just let the women write, it's support anyone who's putting women forward as the carriers of the story. So I always talk about you because because um, you do that so well. So um, can you talk about writing for specific actors and how that, I don't know, does that help? Do you prefer to do it that way? How does it change your writing or? I mean, I think it depends. Uh, honestly, most of my, I still, I think it's, a, it's, formative. it's formative basically. Like when you have an experience with an actor that you're like, oh, oh wow, this person really gets what I'm doing and they've really kind of like brought this to life in a way that I didn't have to say to them, okay, what I really was hoping for is, or say to the director, not to them, sorry, but I didn't have to say to the director, oh, could you ask her to do it? Like, so yeah. I think that, I, I think when you have that experience and you find the right people, um, or if there's an actor that you have admired on stage who you, you know that they do beautiful work, then it's really, really fun to write for someone. I mean, honestly, I have, there's a few actors in Atlanta, um, Joe Sykes, Kate Donatio, Kathleen Wattis. Um, uh, the, there's a few actors that, that I write all of my plays for, even if those people are never gonna be in the plays. Those are people who understand my work and Atlanta was my artistic home for a very long time and still is one of my artistic homes. My parents are still there and I go back all the time for work and for her family. And like those, those people, I have their voices so clearly and how I imagine they will execute these things, then I will kind of mentally put them into my head. But the only trick to that is that then when you get the actual actors who are gonna be in it, like sometimes there's like a little bit of a like moment of like, oh, cause that's not, you know, I mean, we all know that it's not gonna be like what we, excuse me, once you've been through enough productions, you kind of take it as a given that it's not going to be at all what it was in your head. It's going to be something else and that thing can be beautiful. But what you had in your head was just you. And now there's a whole lot of people involved, right? <laughs> like, um, and so that's kind of the beauty of theater, the collaborative process. But I think writing for specific actors can be helpful whether or not those actors ever end up playing the role. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I love to do the like fantasy casting game sometimes halfway through a skip to go like, I'm writing this for Ewan McGregor. <laughs> um, just to see, I don't know what, what that does and why not. I had like this, but I, but I'll say this, like for this most, for the television show right now, like when I was hired, um, they already knew that uh, Kaylee Cuoco was going to be the lead. And so I spent some time with her and I have to tell you that like, she made writing that character like infinitely more accessible to me and easier to me because it's a character that has to do some not great things but you spend 10 minutes with her and you're like oh i can get away with murder with this character because the charisma on the other side of it i mean like yeah. you really like learn those things when you sit down with someone yeah. and so um i think it can be really kind of like it can open your perspective a lot if you're writing for someone specifically um because it kind of in a weird way, it's sort of like when you're given a prompt to write, when you're given like, you can only use two characters, you have to have a lamp somewhere, you know, it, yeah, has, to, yeah. it has to be about a natural disaster, like, I don't know, whatever. And then it rains frogs. But like, the, if when you're given those things, and it can be oddly freeing, because mm. you find all of these new ways to interpret those things or approach the story. And so I think that's true with actors, too. Yeah. Like, it can be, you know, it, whatever, I hate saying whatever works for you when we're in a class situation, we're trying to be helpful to people, but you should never feel like there's a wrong way to approach it. I do want to say this just real quick, because it occurred to me earlier, one of my favorite things about 10 minute plays and, and, and I, this has been throughout my career so beneficial is that they are the perfect uh, laboratory. Like it is the perfect place for you to try something. Like if you want to write a play where three people stand on stage and talk to the audience at the same time, overlapping the entire time, and see if it works, do it. Great. If you want to write a, a, a play where it, you know, everybody's talking about it raining teddy bears and then it does, 
do it. If you want to write a play where the dead guy that's buried alive is buried on stage and then a giant flower springs up like Sarah Kane style at the end of it, do it. Like, because yeah. in 10 minute plays, it's the old hat that I'm now beating. It's the horse. It's the dead horse that I'm beating again as I combine all my things. <laughs> you can do, and if an audience knows it's only 10 minutes, they will sit through almost anything except being bored, but yes. they will sit through almost anything, right? We, we went to that talk where Tony Kushner was like, you cannot bore people like that's oh, the I've, I've told them and I thought <laughs> yes I was like Steve and I we saw Tony Kusher and he was like you're killing the Toddler. child's <laughs> worth of lifespan with the amount of boring theater out there <laughs> oh, it's emotionally scarred me forever um but I do but think we did not forget the cardinal yeah, no, no yeah, boring it's effective um and the I way I like to say it is if the audience is bored that's not their fault it's your fault yeah absolutely and I think like, look, you can do something that makes absolute, look, my Alice Twan writes some of the best 10 minute plays that I've ever seen. I don't know to a play if I could tell you what any of them are about. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But she knows what they're about. And so her characters are moving with motivation. They all have wants. There is conflict, there is action happening. Bizarre, crazy things are happening on stage. And I, at the end of it, I have this like, it's like Im impressionism in a way. Like I, like I'm, I have a feeling from having watched the play without understanding fully what it was about. So don't be afraid to use a 10 minute play to like try every crazy narrative approach that you want to try because that's what they're there for. And you might find your thing and it might become a, 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 a cornerstone of your full length plays. You know what I mean? I mean, I will say that's actually quite true because a lot of the stuff when I did, when I, when Steve does make me write 10 minute plays, I often find myself returning to a theme or a circumstance. And a lot of this was violence against women or women survivors, women resilience, and kind of going, all right, well, I can play with how far I can go um, in, in, in these plays and play with what it is, play with direct address versus. Um, every other kind of form, play with musicality, play with poetry, um, and kind of use it exactly as you said, as a, as a laboratory to figure out what what do I care about? Like, what do I really want theater to do um, in this way? Which is great. Um, one last thing before we go, I have we have person Charlie Cote. Hi, Charlie, who is from Atlanta. He's an Atlanta-based writer. And um, wanted to talk a little bit about that, which both of us are from Atlanta. And... Um, yeah, so we, we've had different career paths, but I think both represent a way um, that Atlanta really brought us up quite well. <laughs> um, yeah. And we still consider it home and artistic homes. Um, we've both worked at certainly at Dad's Garage, at Actors Express, at Theatrical Outfit, um, you know, all of the, all of the synchronicity that there's so many, so, so, so many. Um, at Essential Theater, uh, who certainly gave me many of my very first commissions, first awards, first productions. Um, so I'm grateful and very proud of being from Atlanta. How is and there's, lots of young, there's a lots of young companies there right now too. Yeah. That I, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even know the names of, but I know my friends are like going to see this work and being like, have you heard of this company? They've done three productions, all of them are amazing. So there's, there's like, and Out of Hand is still putting on crazy things and- Oh gosh, Out of Hand is the greatest. Yeah, they're yeah. doing amazing they've work. Kind of adopted, they've kind of adopted this like um, the theater in your home model where they're yeah. taking the show into people's living rooms and like it, that, that sort of like kind of- And very a lot of social justice issues in a really interesting way. I've kind of never seen theater do that before, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy what all the, there's a lot of great stuff going on in Atlanta. Um, I remember when we were there, that you know I sort of said this we would sit like we'd sit there over coffee or over drinks many drinks and be like I don't know the the larger theater community this is something good for people to know whatever town you're in whatever community you're in it can feel like the larger American theater is like very it's Moscow in the three it's like we're never going to get there like how do, I, how do I connect to that yeah. thing and I don't want to just be this character that's always like one day we'll go to Moscow and then we don't go like but it's this it's this idea that you you can do it it is accessible you you submit to things it feels far away you build theaters you build relationships with your local theaters and then you start to find out about organizations and then you start to find out about programs you can apply to and then you start to find out and there are different ways to get out of it and the entire time you, you spend all this time trying to get out of the town. And then I remember we were in, um, it was one day in San Francisco, we were having lunch and both of us were like, 
I want to have another play in Atlanta. And I was like, this is so dumb. Always like the grass is always greener bullshit, but like. Yes, we spend all this time being like, one day I'll get out of Atlanta. And now we're like, one day I'll get back to Atlanta. <laughs> Basically. Um, well, yes. And I will say that it's also true that these theater companies that you develop relationships with, and they know you, they know your work. They're like on your team, no other theaters. And they're like, you know, there's a theater that's exactly like Synchronicity in San Francisco. There's a theater that's exactly like Actors Express in Chicago. And they share, you know, recommendations. And so it really is a way to kind of um, look at where you are and who you are in, in, in your local place and then use that as a way to make relationships beyond that and certainly as a way to work on your work i mean that's the first thing you're not going to have a career as a playwright until you have plays and plays yeah. that you can say this is what i mean this is who i am this is exactly what i'm about and that you only do that with you know readings and workshops and productions um to to know to know that about yourself I will say just real quick plug at the end for, um, I have no personal stake in this, but for MPX, the, the new play exchange, um, because if you are trying to get your 10 minute play published or uh, not published, uh, produced, and um, you know, you can put it up on, I, I have a 10 minute play up on new play exchange right now um, called Adorable Kitten Image Collapse. Oh my God, I, this play is so good. Y'all have to go read it. It is. <laughs> Yes, ostensibly. It's about oh. who are these people who cyberbully, but whatever. The, the, the idea is you put your 10 minute play up, you check all the boxes and stuff. And then rather than you having to like apply to everything that you get alerts from MPX where you're like, your 10 minute play may be eligible for this. It might be eligible for this. It could be eligible for this. And it really kind of like, in a way that I never expected, kind of get your work into the mix because now you're not digging through those books that they used to put out, but like- From the source I'm, book. I loved I'm, it. So uh, highlighted uh, and dog-eared and sticky. And <laughs> Everyone that's watching this, it probably has nine MPX pages and knows exactly when I'm just behind but, the times. And Steve means a new play exchange. You can go newplayexchange.org. We've talked about it a couple of times, but it is such a great resource and a place where if you go, I don't know where this play belongs, that's one place to start. And the other thing you can do, it's a great place to read. So you can find people who really get, um, get your style or get your taste or writing in a similar way or about similar things and build a little cohort of it really has become it really has been, and i know this was the intent of it but i was always like it's not gonna happen like it really has become a forum in terms of like a place where you can go to read plays and share plays so i just think yeah. that that's exciting and and good for people who have like three 10 minute plays but they can't figure out how to get them produced or where to send them or like stuff put them up on mpx build your page put your little bio up there and then check off all the things that apply to your play and then you'll start getting those notifications. Yeah, I think it's a great, that's a fabulous tip to end on. Um, I'm so sorry we have to end, I miss you so much. I hope this was helpful, I feel this like- This was I so great. Well, you have, I will say, I will stop complimenting you eventually, but maybe not, maybe not ever. Um, <laughs> you just have given me such inspiration and clarity about my career and at a point where I was like, I don't know, I think I just write weird, ambiguous ending to plays that are kind of sciencey and that's what I do I guess. <laughs> Steve was uh, like you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I find great empowerment in structure and in community and you're always a combination both very inspiring but also very just practical like here's the deal on page eight you should like think about having a climax. <laughs> <laughs> page eight of your <laughs> page eight of your, okay, of your 10 minute play dear lord not on the <laughs> Climax, do it. Do it's it. Fine. So anyway, thank you so, so, so much. Um, and thanks Absolutely. for all the questions, y'all. Um, yeah, I'll go back and answer any other things and maybe I'll poke Steve and see if he'll answer if there's any other stuff. And thank you. And I love you and I